Uh, my name is Tiffany. My husband, Elliot, and I have the great honor of being able to pastor this group of people called Lifeline Church. You are the church. You are the people. We love you. Or so I'm happy to see all your faces. I think it's amazing. Um, we are in a series called A Little Bit of Wisdom. Wasn't that a fun theme song? It just, you just want to groove to it. No? No? Come on. Get a little groovy. A ah, Little Bit of Wisdom. This is week two. We're going to be talking about the secret of contentment. Uh, most of the scriptures that we're going to be using in this series are out of the book of Proverbs. I just want to set the book of Proverbs up and this idea of wisdom for a minute. Um, the book of Proverbs in the Bible was written by King Solomon. King Solomon was the son of King David. Uh, and Solomon is the king who made such a huge sacrifice to God when he became th- king that God was, God was so impressed by the sacrifice that he came to Solomon and said, ask me anything you want. Ask me anything you want, and I'll give it to you because you so honored me. And King Solomon, it's recorded that King Solomon asked for wisdom. And so God said, absolutely, I will give that to you. Gave him wisdom. Um, And so God granted the request, and King Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs. And essentially what the book of Proverbs is, is it's a bunch of little quotes of wisdom from the very mouth of God to the king of Israel to help govern the people. Uh, and so that's why we're, we're using Proverbs. And the book of Proverbs talks a lot about wisdom. Uh, last week, Pastor Elliot opened this series, and he talked about the four different types of people that are written in Proverbs. Uh, if you guys were able to be here, then you should know what they are. If not, I'm going to recap them really quick. Uh, and that was, there's the simple the simple is often the young. They just don't know yet. You're sim- we're simple because we have not heard. We do not know. Uh, Proverbs and wisdom, it talks about the fool. Uh, the fool is the person who, uh, they can't be simple anymore because now they've been told. <laughs> uh, but they just choose not to. Like, they just don't take good advice. That's a foolish person. And then there's the mocker. The mocker, <laughs> Elliot said, is the fool on steroids. So the mocker is the one that says, I'm going to take your advice and I'm going to mock you. I'm going to make fun of you because you believe that that's true, the, the fool on steroids. And then there's very simply the wise person who listens, who hears good advice, and who applies it to their life, who makes shifts and adjustments in order to, to bring wisdom and life into their, their person. Uh, And the big takeaway from last week was this. When I understand what it means to fear God, I can live fearlessly. Um, And so it was a really great message. If you you missed it, you can go back and watch that either on our Facebook page or YouTube page. They're up for you to be able to catch the whole series. Um, If you are taking notes, we have bulletin inserts for you. There are fill in the blanks. So get your pens out, people, and fill in those blanks. Uh, if you're not a paper note taker, we are on version. You can pull up the version Bible app, which is how I prefer to take notes. So I pull up the events tab, and then I follow along, and you can click add note. And so I add note, and then I can save it, and I can save the event, and I can refer back to those notes anytime just on my phone. So uh, before we get started, I just want to pray. Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that it is truth. Lord, I thank you when we hear your word, that you are so faithful to, to bring your word to pass. If we, if we hear your word, if we receive it, and if we apply it, Lord, we will find life and hope and peace in our life. And I thank you for that because you are good. We open our hearts to receive what it is that you would say to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so let's talk about it. Our theme scripture is out of Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7, and it says this, wisdom is supreme. Therefore, get wisdom. (laughs) Though it costs you all you have, get understanding. So wisdom is going to cost you something. It'll cost you everything that you have, but get it anyway. It's worth it, says the scripture. So from the mouth of God to King Solomon, who asked God for wisdom, God told Solomon, though it costs you all you have, get wisdom get understanding. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to spend six weeks getting wisdom. This is week two. So this is the scripture that's going to set up what we're talking about today. It's Proverbs 19, verse 23, and it says, the fear of the Lord leads to life. Then one rests content, untouched by trouble. So we found out last week that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. So if we fear the Lord, then we're on the right path to getting some wisdom in our life. And now this scripture is saying that fearing the Lord leads to life. If we're fearing the Lord, then we're on our way to life. We're on our way to wisdom. And and it says when one has found a life, then they can rest content, 
untouched by trouble. How many of you guys want to be untouched by trouble? You'd love that in your life. Amen. Yes. Yes. When one has found life, they can rest content, untouched by trouble. So let's talk, let's talk about it. Um, when I was reading that scripture, I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute. I, I mean, I'm a pastor. It makes sense that I would have found some wisdom and some life along the way if I believe in God, right? And I'm reading the scripture, and I'm thinking to myself, I know. I know that I have life, but I still have trouble. Trouble has still found its way to me. This doesn't make any sense. Um, and then, then I was thinking about New Testament, and this is, this is fun. Um, first off, trouble will still happen to you. I have to just, I have to break the bad news to you. Trouble will still happen. Here's the thing. Jesus told his disciples in the New Testament, he was talking to his disciples, his followers, and he said this. <laughs> he said, in this world, you will have trouble. It was a promise. He promised us, you will have trouble. Lousy promise? Anybody? Lousy promise? <laughs> In this world, you will have trouble. Count on it, he said. Count on it. But it was followed by this. But take heart, for I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. So you can overcome trouble. There is a way out of trouble in this life in me was the, was the real promise. So trouble will come. Even if we're following Jesus, we're giving him everything we've got, trouble is still going to come into our life because it was a promise. And here's the thing. Trouble will always aim to steal our joy. It will always aim to steal our hope. It will always aim to steal our faith. When I say steal our faith, I mean trouble will always aim to get us to disagree with the word of God and say God's not good on his word because I'm experiencing trouble. That's what trouble will do. <clears throat> but Jesus has overcome the world. And wisdom from God says, if you fear me, you will be content, untouched by trouble. So what we want to do is we want to talk about contentment, the secret of contentment. Because if we are content, then we are untouched by trouble. But I just wanna, I wanna talk about that contentment. So if there is contentment in our life, no matter what trouble comes our way, we will be untouched. You will be unshakable. Your faith will not waver. You will never lose hope because you know your God is faithful who called you. Your God who saved you is good to his word and he makes all things new. He brings beauty from ashes. So in the trouble and in the ash heap, you believe that your God is going to bring beauty. He restores the brokenhearted. So when your heart is broken and you're going through a hard time, you know, my God restores the brokenhearted. He sees me. He is here for me. God will use what the enemy intends for harm to bring good. God is able to heal the sick and to raise the dead. If there are sick things in your life, if there are dead things in your life, if there are dead relationships in your life, you know your God is able to heal and to bring restoration when we rest content. Amen? So I want to talk about this, this word contentment for a sec. Because <clears throat> when I think about contentment, I think sometimes contentment makes me think of lazy people. <laughs> Like, if I'm content, then, you know, I wish I had my lazy boy recliner up here. Because contentment is like, I've got all I need. I'm not, there's nothing more I want in life. You know, I'm not working towards anything. <clears throat> so I can just sit content. For me, that's, you know, I got my two tiny humans, and we're sitting on the couch, and we're covered up in our blankie, and I am content. I don't need anything in the world. But contentment, it's not talking about being lazy. It's not talking about kicking back and loafing through life. Like, I'm content. I don't need to work hard anymore. That's not what it's talking about. Contentment is about being full of life and at peace. It's being full of life and at peace, which allows us to live an impactful life. An impactful life. So I just uh, I want to talk about some people who are, when I think of one who rests content, they've found life and they're untouched by trouble, I adopted my friend's grandparents. I love them. I love them so much. Some of you may know them. Their names are Richard and Patricia Worley. Uh, if you're watching, I love you. And uh, here's the thing. They're grandparents, so they're older, and they have experienced life. Trouble has come their way. Yet no matter what has come their way, they've never given up on God. Their faith has never been shooken, shaken, however you say that word. Like, uh, let for just talk about it for a second. Uh, they have three children, 
and they're older, so the kids, you know, grown families, grandchildren, all that kind of stuff, and they lost their son to an illness. And in the middle of that, that pain, in the middle of that hardship, they never said, God, why? They said, God, you're good. God, you're good. And they were able to give hope and life and encouragement, even in the middle of something so horrendous. Uh, they, they used to be pastors. They are pastors. They were pastoring in a different state, and they had retired, and so they had their retirement home. And then they were called out of retirement to go pastor another church up here in California who needed some help, and they said, okay, yes. So they, they got rid of their retirement home. They sold it, and they moved up here. And through a series of circumstances, they pastored the church. It was great. And then they retired again. And then th they didn't get to keep that home, and so they lended, ended up living in, an, in a trailer, like an RV. They're, they're retired they lived in a nice house, they got called out of retirement, and now they're living in an RV, in an RV park, and they're not discontent. They're still saying, man, my God is good. They didn't have their big retirement home, they didn't have all that, but still their God was good. I want to be those people. I want to be content even if I don't have everything I think I want. Amen? Amen. So contentment. Uh, the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom, leads to life, which is what leaves us content or full of life in a broken world. Who wants to be full of life in a broken world? I do. I do, because if I'm full of life in a broken world, I know other people have hope, because I'm a beacon of light in this broken world. So today we're going to uncover the secret of contentment, uh, because we live in a culture that is discontent. Okay, so just for fun, let's, I want to bring up I want to bring up your discontentment for a second. I want you to feel it for just a moment so we can get rid of it, so we can recognize it, acknowledge it, and say, okay, let's get rid of that. Let's, let's replace it with some contentment. So it's the end of the day. This is where I notice my discontentment. The end of the day, and which is like 8 o'clock at night, and I'm sitting. I, we do, we, they're not lazy boys, but we do have recliners. And so we sit in them, and I got my blanket, and I'm ready to like watch some Jeopardy because that's what we're doing on Netflix. We're watching old Jeopardy. It's fun. And so I pull it up. I pull up Netflix, and I, I just get started watching it, and then all of a sudden, the loading screen pops up. You know the loading screen where it spins and circles? And it's 5%, and it says 7%, 9%, 25%. And you're like, yes, we're going places. And then it stops at 25%, and it just keeps spinning, and it just keeps spinning, and it just keeps spinning. And you're like, this is me. I pay what the heck is wrong with the internet? because I pay for the fastest quality internet. And I know I'm in the area. Like, I should not have to wait for my TV to buffer. It shouldn't be happening, right? OK, and then finally it goes 100%. And you're like, yes! And your show comes back on. And then it's grainy. And the people are like blurry, you know? And you're like, OK, wait a second. I also pay for high definition. On Hulu, you can pay $11.99 and get high definition instead of low definition, or whatever the heck it is that they call it, OK? And then, so, so you're sitting there, and you had to, to wait for the load, and then, so it brings up discontentment. And I feel, oftentimes, I feel like, um, why, why am I wasting all my money on this stuff if it doesn't work half the time? But I just want to bring us back. If you're like me, and you get a little discontent with your internet connection or your TV, uh, let's go back in time, uh, because if I remember this, then most of you should remember this, when you couldn't fast forward through a commercial. Anybody? Anybody? You couldn't do that. You had to, this is fun, you had to wait a whole week for the next episode to drop. You actually, we, I mean, we actually had to live in suspense, like, what's going to happen if it was a show? Because you couldn't just binge watch it. You had to wait. And then here's another fun thing. This is fun because if, if you go back, you can see where people's priorities were. Did they schedule their life around their TV watching or did they schedule their TV watching around their life. Because if someone wanted to hang out with you and it was 7 o'clock, you're like, no, I can't. My show's on. Oh. <laughs> because now you can just watch your show later. You know what I mean? Like, you can just pick Saturday, stay home all day, and catch up on all your episodes. But we didn't used to be able to do that. Here's another fun thing. A movie. We couldn't just buy a movie for $3.99 or $2.99 or five, whatever kind of quality you want determines the price you pay. We had to go outside in the rain. It was just raining really hard. Like last Sunday, it was pouring down rain. You would have had to go to the Blockbuster or to the Hollywood or to the Redbox to go get your movie. And then if it was a Friday or Saturday and the movie just came out, they might not even have it. Like all your hopes are crushed because you went out in the rain and you are too late. 
you were too late and you don't get to watch that movie. Isn't that funny? That is so funny. We have more at our fingertips than any generation before us. <clears throat> we can quite literally instantly gratify almost any desire that we have, whether it's a good desire or whether it's a destructive desire. And yet all the statistics, because people study us all the time, the, the statistics say that we are more discontent than previous generations. Interesting. We have more than ever, quicker than ever, and we are more unhappy than ever. Whoa. Whoa. Uh, so part of what fuels our discontentment is that we live in a culture of comparison, which is kind of what we want to break down for a minute. We are instantly connected to almost anyone and anything in the world, yet it hasn't brought people closer together. It has kind of driven us apart. And, and I think that's because instead of being with people, we're looking at people. Uh, so there's, there's a scripture, Proverbs 14.30, and it says this, a heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. So if you are filling in the blanks, we're going to move to those right now. Comparison. We're going to talk about what comparison makes life about. So the first blank is that comparison makes life about the wrong perspective. Comparison makes life about the wrong perspective. So I want to bring up uh, social media just because it's an easy target, not because I hate it. I actually use social media. I'm on it. Uh, and you know what? You know what's really fun is that social media, okay, I'm going to talk about it uh, because it fuels our discontentment and it fuels our ability to compare ourselves. But the cool thing about social media is that it was intended to be a tool to bring resources and creativity uh, to make it available to everyone. Like we could, it was a creative space where we could share resources and we could share ideas and it could be instantaneous. Like we could just get a good idea and run with it. So it was created with good intentions. And if we're honest, social media probably started way back with the world wide web. The world wide web, connect everywhere. Uh, and then it's, it's morphed. Anybody remember MySpace? What, what, MySpace? And then MySpace kind of fizzled out and Facebook came along. There's Facebook, and then Facebook was followed by Instagram, and then Instagram was followed by Snapchat, and now we got, I don't even know what they are. I'm not that old. I'm only 30 years old, and I feel like I'm, well, quite older when it comes to social media, because it changes so rapidly, and it updates so quickly. It's crazy. There's LinkedIn for professional networking. Like, there are so, so many things. So here's what I want to say. Social media, it was intended, it was created as a tool intended to bring people together to create a place where ideas and resources could be shared, created with good intentions, and it can be used as a tool to enhance our life. Yet for most of us, it leaves us discontent. This tool that was created for good, it's, it's neither evil nor good, it's just a tool, that's all it is. But we use it, most of us, I mean, let's be honest, most of us use it wrong, and we end up discontent instead of full of creative good ideas. Come on, come on. Instead of saying, hey, that's a really good idea, you say, man, I'm a little bit jealous that they had that idea, not I. <laughs> I mean, come on. Okay, this is, again, because they're studying us all the time. Studies are, are showing, it's possible that you've heard this statistic, 10 minutes a day scrolling on whatever you're using will leave a person more dissatisfied with their life than when they got on it in the first place. Here's a little bit of wisdom. If you're having a bad day, Avoid the interweb, <laughs> okay? That's a little bit of wisdom. If you're having a bad day, just stay off of it because that's not going to make it better more than likely. Unless we're using it right, it's not going to make it better. It's going to use it worse. Use it worse, it's going to make it worse. Okay, so because what we're doing is we're looking for a heart at peace, right? I'm not looking for a heart full of envy. Are you? No, no. We're looking for a heart at peace. And what happens is envy enters when we compare ourselves to others and we come up with the wrong perspective. Social media, it's not bad, it's just a great place to come up with the wrong perspective. And so if we're using it, let's use it as a tool to enhance our life, not as one to drive discontentment, amen? Okay, number two is uh, comparison makes life about the wrong presumption. Comparison makes life about the wrong presumption. Comparis com comparison can lead us to, to come up with the wrong idea, basically. Uh, we presume that happiness is only one click away. <laughs> uh, do you need a better boyfriend? Do you need a better girlfriend? They're only one click away. Look at this person right here. 
One click away. They can be yours. Uh, do you need a better marriage? Same thing. Only one click away. They're right there. Um, here's another one. Need to get out of debt? One click away. We'll consolidate all of it for you. Lies. Lies. Okay. The wrong presumption says that we are only one click away from happiness. Presumption says happiness is over here and not right here. Presumption says that we are one click away from life being better. Presumption says that I can't have a good life here. I've got to find it over here. Okay? Uh, but the problem with comparison is that comparison is a moving target. I presume that my happy life is over here, and so I get here. Guess what? I'm still not happy. <laughs> okay, so then, then the presumption is, this, I, had a, I had a bad idea. It was wrong, but this idea is going to be better. So now my happiness is found over here, and we keep moving, and we're never going to find happiness because it's presumption. We're, we have the wrong presumption because we're comparing our lives to something that's not the Word of God. So what we want to do is we want to break out of that cycle of comparison because if we don't, we're going to miss the life God gave us. Presumption, the wrong presumption says the life God gave you isn't here. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. God gave you a life. He gave you a life. It is a lie that you need to compare yourself and be like them. It is a lie that someone else's success makes you a failure. That's a lie. If we're looking around and we're saying they're successful and I'm not, and that makes me a failure, that's a lie from the pit of hell. And so if you find yourself, I, I set you free in the name of Jesus because it is a lie. And the word says, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. God came to, to give sight to the blind. He came to raise the dead. He came to heal the sick. He came to restore the brokenhearted. And you know what that means? That means that the right presumption is that good life is found here, right where I am, right where I am. Uh, so we want to expose some lies. We want to expose some deceptions of the enemy that will keep us from living a content, impactful, peace-filled life right where we are. And when I was thinking about this, it was kind of funny. Just a funny way to illustrate this idea of the presumption is this. Um, you're at home. We're, we're working the Dave Ramsey plan. Woof, woof. We're on like baby step. I don't remember what baby step we're on. But we're doing the Dave Ramsey plan. We're following it, and it's amazing. Here's the thing. I meal plan, and sometimes the meal that's on the list is, duh, what I want to eat. Anybody? 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 Spaghetti. I don't really like it. I don't like spaghetti. But it is on the list a lot. And so when spaghetti pops up, like, oh, dang, dang it, I got to eat spaghetti. I think to myself, you know what? My better dinner is over here. <laughs> My better dinner is one click away. So we have, this is funny, because we have ordered out before, thinking, I, me, it's me, it's all me. I'm thinking, that's going to be a better dinner. That's going to be a better dinner. It's only one click away. So I've ordered out my better dinner, and it has come. It was not better. No, it was not better. In fact, I spent $30 on a worse dinner, okay? So now I'm $30 in the hole, and I don't like dinner. And I'm thinking to myself, you know what will make dinner better? One click away is ice cream. Ice cream. So in order to, to make up for this terrible dinner that I ordered out, I'm going to go get ice cream. And it's the end of the day, and I'm already in my comfy, so you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to run up to the Arco on the corner because nobody cares what you look like at the Arco on the corner, and I'm going to buy overpriced ice cream. Okay, I'm going to spend $5 on a pint because that's how much it costs there, okay? So here's the thing. I'm back here. I'm working my Dave Ramsey plan. I thought happiness. I thought I was going to find so much happiness in my better dinner, right? So I get my better dinner, and it's not better, okay? And then I think, ah, oh, ice cream will make this better. So now I come over here. I have spent $40 out of my, not in my budget, Okay, so as I'm eating my ice cream, I'm realizing, first, the ice cream is really good. By the way, it's like Jamocha almond fudge. Boop, boop. It's good ice cream. But I'm thinking to myself, you know what? I just blew $40, and we're supposed to go out with some friends this weekend. And so now I've overspent, and I find myself discontent. There's discontentment there because I presumed that happiness was one click away. And when I kept chasing those clicks, and then it all settled in. I was like, nope, nope, that wasn't it. Comparison leads us to the wrong presumption. <clears throat> Here's another one. Comparison leads us to the, comparison makes life about the wrong person, about the wrong person. There's something called around, maybe, I didn't know that this was a thing. It's a thing. It's called FOMO. Anybody? Fear of missing out. 
is what it is. And what it is, is uh, it's real. And it's short for, oh, no, fear of missing out. It's a pervasive anxiety that we are going to miss out on something. And so it drives us to stay connected to things far away. Uh, for instance, it's what prompts you to pick up your phone and see if you missed a text message or you missed a voicemail or you missed an email or if someone liked or commented or shared one of your social media posts. It's that fear of what did I miss, what's happening. And so it drives us to stay connected to things far away and to disconnect from what is happening currently in our life. So what, what will happen is if we're not careful, we will miss out on what we have by continuously connecting to what is far away. Uh, when we're present with people, so, okay, let's talk about it. I'm right here with you right now. I'm talking to you. If I were to just pull out my phone and reply to a text message, I would have disconnected from you, and I would have connected to something that's not even here, right? Uh, this happened the other day. We were... We love to play board games on the weekends uh, when Corbin is here. And so uh, Friday night, we were playing Catan. It's a good board game. And my, my phone was right next to me. Should have put it somewhere else. My phone was right next to me, and I saw it lit up with a text message. And I was like, oh, what's that? Shiny. And so I, I turned, I picked up my phone, and I, I engaged with the, the conversation. So I began replying to a text message. And now everybody that I'm with has to wait for me to disconnect over here and reconnect right here. FOMO will cause us to miss the life that God gave us. It will cause us to miss the life that God gave us if we keep, if we keep connecting far away and disconnecting here. And again, I'm not saying those things are bad, but let's just be wise about it. If we're present with people, why would we disconnect here to connect over here? Let's connect where we are and save that disconnection or that connecting far away for a later time. So let's talk about the secret of contentment. How do we become content? Ecclesiastes 4, chapter, chapter 4, verse 6 says this, Better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. In other words, it's better to have less and be at peace than it is to have more and be in constant pursuit of more. Uh, I delivered this message for service, and it was really funny. It was really cool, actually. Someone came up to me and said, you know, that message is really good. They're... Uh, they're Comcast. They had to get rid of their internet, and so they don't. They, they can't watch TV right now. Um, and at first, they were kind of grumpy. And then, but they said, "This is what they said." But you know what? We're actually more connected. We have to like talk to each other, and we get to color or play games. And so it's driven them to be more connected. But it didn't happen until they had less. There was more contentment with less. Fun fact: more is less. More is less. Uh, so just want to say, if you're feeling discontent, try getting rid of some of your stuff. <laughs> try getting rid of some of your stuff and see what begins to happen in your life. We have more at our fingertips than any other generation, yet we're finding out that more doesn't equal content. In fact, more leaves us striving after more. And, and it leaves us feeling like we're wasting our lives on things that don't matter. We're constantly in pursuit of the next good thing, and the next good thing is never filling up what it is that we think we're missing. Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13 says this. I'm, it's Paul writing to the church, and he says, I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in, every, in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Now, that last part of the scripture we hear quite often, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, or I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And it's true, and it can be applied to various situations in our lives. But what I love right here is that it was written about contentment. I can do, I can be content in every situation because it is my God who gives me strength to do that. Paul is saying that through Christ, he can be content in every situation, whether he is legitimately in need, and he had legitimately been in need, but he was content. Remember that, it's uh, 
the fear of the Lord leads to life, and then one rests content, untouched by trouble. So even though he was in need, and even though he was starving, he was untouched by trouble. He was unfazed by the circumstances and the problems that were coming his way because he was content with his God. Do you want that in your life? I do, because trouble will come. Hunger will come. Need will come. We will be faced with those things. But you know what? If we have found life in Jesus and we have learned the secret of contentment, then it doesn't matter what comes our way. We will be unfazed by that trouble. So let's talk about it. How do we become content in Christ? Blank number one in this section. Number one, we're going to realize what we have. Realize what we have. When a hard week hits, Come on, let's be honest. It is so easy to come up with a list of things that would make our life better. Like, I wish I had a maid. <laughs> I wish I had a live-in cook. I wish I had my own personal shopper. I wish I had a landscaper. I wish I had a bigger house because I have too much stuff. I have too many kids. However it is that that breaks down for you. Uh, I wish I had more money. I wish I had a better job because these people are the worst. Whatever it is, when a hard week hits, we know, or at least we think we know, what would make life better. I wish I had a more attentive husband. I wish I had a nicer wife. All the things. But the antidote to that, I'm going to give it to you and you're going to hate it. It's this. Make a list right now. Even if you're feeling um, discontent, if you're feeling discontent right now, I want you to make a list of all the things that you have. Think of all the things you have. I have a, I have a house to live in, even if it's 250 square feet got a place to live. I got a bed to sleep in, even if the springs are popping through it. <laughs> I have a bed to sleep in. I have, I have a warm place to stay at night. I have a church family who loves me and cares about me and, and is there for me. I have a hoopty to drive. Hasn't died yet, okay? Uh, I have the privilege of raising kids whom God has a plan for. It's a privilege to raise these kids, even if they're being crazy, okay? I have a husband or a wife who is still with me, even on my bad days. I have a God who will never give up on me. I have a God who has made me the head and not the tail. I have a God who is my peace and who sees every tear that I cry and who works out all things together for the good of those who love him. And I love him, so I know he's working out all things for my good. Amen? Amen. Amen. We're going to make a list. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 15 says, through 17 says this, Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus, might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. We have a God who is good. So we're going to realize what we have. We're going to write it down. That way when discontentment or FOMO hits, we have something to fight back with. We're not going to keep clicking, okay? We're not going to keep clicking our life away. Here's the fun thing. We're going to tie this back to last week. The simple just didn't know that. The simple, you're not simple anymore. You know hard times are going to come. You know trouble will come your way. You can't be simple anymore. The fool, though, you can't be foolish. I hope, I hope you're not going to be. The fool will say, I don't need to make a list. The fool says, I'm not going to make a list. The mocker says, I hate your list. Your list is dumb, okay? If you're, if you're feeling like that, make a list, okay? And then the wise says, okay, maybe there's some truth here. I know trouble's going to come, and I know I have a tendency to be discontent, and so I'm going to make a list because I'm going to fight back. Amen? Make a list. Number two, we're going to make God our source. Discontentment is not really about stuff. It's about a void in our life. Philippians 2, 12 and 13 says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Every person has mountains and valleys. We all have ups and downs in our life. And it's possible that we found God when we were at a down in our life. And we know how to run back to God when we're at a down in our life. But when, I mean, let's be honest, when life is good, um, we make something else our source. Not intentionally. Let me break this down. I've been following Jesus since I was 12 years old, since I was a tiny person. And I, I, I know that God is good. 
and I know that I want to please God. I've always lived my life to, to I, I just, I want to do it right. I want to love you. I want to be in your presence because I know that you're good and all these things. And so I've never walked away from Jesus, but I have found myself discontent. And I have found myself feeling like I was missing something. And you know what? Without fail, when I began to feel that way and I began to recognize it, and I would finally be like, hey, God, why do I feel this way? <laughs> then he'd, he, he, would, he would graciously show me, hey, Tiff, uh, you haven't read your Bible in a long time. <laughs> uh, hey, Tiff. You remember when you used to just talk to me, you know, like, thank you for this, or, hey, thank you, I'm having a good day. You don't really do that anymore. And so here's what had happened. I knew God was my source. I knew that he was my source. I knew that he was my God. I knew that he was my salvation. But I stopped connecting with him on a daily basis. He was just like, oh, yeah, he's good. But I was doing my own thing. And so he wasn't my source anymore. I had just dis I had unplugged. I disconnected from the source. I knew where the source was. I knew how to find the source. I just wasn't finding it. I wasn't connecting to it. And let me, nothing bad was going on in my life. It was real life. I was young. I had just graduated high school, and I was working full time. And I was going to school at nighttime or online. So you know, that's a full day. That's a full day if you're working, you know, and then you do the thing. Um, so I just was, I, it, there was a new season in my life, and I hadn't shifted in figuring out how to reprioritize my time. So when I, when I entered that season, it was just, it was like, oh, oh, okay. So I have to be able to do this and connect to you. So I had to just prioritize what I was doing. And there was another time in the middle of that that I got a boyfriend. Dumb idea. Because it, not that boyfriends are bad. It was just whatever. Anyway, um, but here's the thing. When we get a boyfriend or a girlfriend, we reprioritize our time. And so I was spending far too much time over here. And I was spending way less time over here with the people who actually keep me grounded and encouraged and with my eyes fixed on Jesus. You know, and I was over here doing this other thing. Uh, and then there was another time. This is a good thing. I got married. Whoop, whoop. But we lived in a 500 square foot apartment. And I didn't know how to find Jesus time when he was always there. You know, I love my husband. I love him so much, but I was so private and so personal. It was like, <gasps> like I just didn't know how to do it. And so I had to refigure that out. And so there, there are ups and downs in our life, and it's all normal life that happens. But we have to pay attention and make sure that we're still connected to the source, even in normal transitions, okay? Uh, I didn't need more stuff, and I didn't need better people. I just needed to make God my source again. And so you're normal if you find yourself there. If you found that you're discontent and you feel disconnected, just reconnect. Just reconnect to the source. It's really simple. 1 Timothy 6.6 6 says, True godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. And C.S. Lewis is quoted as saying that God is like an onion in reverse. So every layer, instead of getting smaller and smaller as you open it, with God, every layer gets bigger and bigger. There is so much more of God to be found as we peel layer by layer away. Everything, this is true. This is really true. Everything we need and everything we lack is found in Christ. Now, when I say that, I'm thinking to myself that sometimes I've been the fool. And it's like, well, maybe, maybe that's true, but I feel like I could still do life better on my own. <laughs> I feel like I could probably find contentment somewhere else. Uh, the mocker says, you're a fool for believing that. I can't believe you spend all your time at church. I can't believe you go to, you attend a life group. I can't believe you actually read your Bible and you actually pray. Do you think that's working? That's what the mocker says. And then the wise says, maybe there's some truth here. And the wise person will begin to reprioritize their time and make sure that they're connecting to the source. The third thing is we're going to live our life on mission. Live our life on mission. Philippians 3, 12 through 14 says, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I love this. 
Paul had so much purpose that he didn't have time for comparison. He was so on mission that he wasn't looking around and thinking that someone else was doing a better job than him. And you know what? The same is true for us. When we're on mission, then life is good. And we're able to celebrate the wins of other people because we're on mission and they're on mission. And we're just all on mission together. We have purpose. We have direction. And life is good. Here's the thing. When, when we don't have purpose, And when we don't have direction and we're not on mission, there's nothing but time on our hands to look around and find discontentment, to compare ourselves and say, when we compare ourselves, we we come up with the wrong presumption about ourselves that we're worthless, that we don't have what it takes, uh, that whatever it is, that we can't do it. But when we're on mission, so we're going to live our life on mission. You know what, for me? Mission is simply being with people. If I'm not with people and encouraging people, then I am discontent. But there is so much joy in connecting with a person and saying, no, there's hope here. God is good. And I'm not weird about it. I'm just normal about it. But being in relationship with people, if I'm not in, which is funny because I'm an introvert. I am not recharged by people. Not at all. Nope. Not at all. I need to go recharge when I'm with people, you know, when I've been with people. But It's just the way God created everyone, whether you're introvert or not, I don't care, connection. When we're with people, we will find contentment because God is there. So live your life on mission. If you, this is really simple for us. If you haven't gone through the growth track, if you've been a part of Lifeline and you haven't gone through the growth track or joined the dream team, do it. Do it. Discover your purpose and live on purpose. Live on mission. Find out who you are. Find out who God created you to be. And it's not just here for Sunday mornings, but it's for the rest of the world. When you know who you are, when you know who God has called you to be in your workplace, Monday through Saturday, you can still be on mission and you can drive back the discontentment and be untouched by trouble. Come on. That's good. Okay. So a little bit of wisdom number two. This is the last two blanks. Contentment fills me with life and fortifies me from circumstance. Contentment fills me with life and fortifies me from circumstance. No matter the circumstance, I can be full of life because my God is good. Amen. All right, we're going to pray. If you guys want to go ahead and just close your eyes and bow your heads. Uh, Father, I thank you so much for your word. Lord, I thank you that there is truth there. Lord, and, and I thank you that we don't have to be old and gray uh, to get wisdom. But you've given us your word. And if we apply your word, if we fix our eyes on you, if we surrender our life to you, Lord, that you are so good to bring wisdom. You are so good to bring understanding. I thank you for your written word that we can come and we can read it. Lord, and we, and we ask you for wisdom. That's what your scripture says. It says if, you say, if any of you lacks wisdom, ask, and it will be given to you. It's as simple as that. So, Father, we thank you for your wisdom and we ask for more. Lord, we open our, our lives and our hearts and our minds to receive your wisdom. In the name of Jesus, I ask that none of us would be fools or mockers. Lord, I ask that we would desire to become wise and we would take these words to heart and we begin to apply them in our life. Lord, I thank you that that true riches and true wealth and true contentment, it's not found in stuff. Lord, we don't need more stuff. We don't need to be more successful. We don't need to have more friends. That's not, that's not where contentment is found. Contentment is found in you. Lord, and so I ask that you would, you would open our eyes to see that. Father, I thank you for your contentment and I ask that that we would find ourselves at peace no matter the circumstance, no matter the situation. We would be fortified from life's circumstances. You are so good. With every eye closed and every head bowed, I want to talk to two groups of people. Number one, if you've never given your life to Jesus and you don't know what contentment looks like, but you really want it, uh, then I'm gonna, I want you to respond. And then the second group of people is if you know God is your source, but you've disconnected, you just, hey, I know he's there, but I haven't connected to him, and you want to reconnect this morning, and I'm talking to you as well. If you're in either one of those two camps, if you just raise your hand, I want to pray with you. I'd love to pray with you and just invite Jesus back. I see your hand. Amen. I see your hands. God is so good. So with the whole church, just repeat after me. Father God, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your son, Jesus, who came to set me free. I receive your wisdom. I receive your life. And I receive your love. 
Father, would you bring contentment into my heart? And would you help me to keep my eyes on you? In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's celebrate because God is good. Because God is good and he keeps calling us back. He keeps calling us back. So I have some next steps for you. We are wrapping up the service in this time, but just stick around for a minute.